Hello, everyone. Today, Team PEL is going to take you on a journey to explore the future of work, the implications for leaders, employees, and organizations. Our presentation is going to be interactive with poll questions throughout the presentation. My name is Narine, and I'm here with my teammates, Amira, JD, Gil, and Jose, and we're the Team PEL. Pathos stands for empathy and compassion, ethos stands for credibility and trust, and LOGOS stands for logic and reason. On the left is our research question and the additional questions from the syllabus. We hope to answer these questions by telling you a story, a story of what could be. And our story begins with the ages of work. To understand the nature of the future workplace, specifically who is the worker and what the workplace environment will look like. And then we will explore the social and demographic trends of a possible future and their implications on the worker and the leader, followed by an understanding of both the challenges and opportunities of future technology, which will lead us to a creation of ideas about how technology can enable leaders, teams, and workers to be successful, resonant organizations and humans. First, we're going to take a poll before we continue with our presentation. A blank in a modern organization is an executive if by virtue of his position or knowledge, he is responsible for a contribution that materially affects the capacity of an organization to perform and to obtain results. If you select a D, you are correct. The correct answer is knowledge worker. And now I'm going to pass it on to Gil to take us through the ages of work. Thank you, Narne, and I'd like you to keep um, this description of the knowledge worker in mind as we go forward into the ages of work. We're going to study this in much the Einstein way. We're going to really try to understand the problem of the future before we offer any solutions. On this slide, we see two images. The upper, uh, upper images, you see the evolution of man from hunter-gatherer to farmer to manufacturer to information creator and distributor. On the bottom, you see the errors of automation from machines taking away dirty and dangerous jobs from humans to the 20th century where automated interfaces took away the dull requirements of the workplace to now the 21st century where machines are literally making decisions for humans. All of this has led to also an evolution of management. And we're going to speak specifically about the three eras of management, according to Rita McGrath. The first era is the execution of mass production. In this era, we are primarily defining quality control, workflow, standard procedures, basic accounting, and we are completely focused on maximizing outputs. And the second era is the era of expertise of management specifically. Think of the rise of universities and business schools, Wharton School, 1881, Harvard Business Review, 1922, and an ever increasing mountain of theory and knowledge, which became a discipline which we ourselves are now studying in EML. Deep thinkers in the second era, such as the father of modern management, Peter Drucker, sent something radically different emerging in that environment, and that was the knowledge worker. The knowledge worker is preeminent in the third era, the era of empathy, which is about relations between customers and employees, about community both within and external to our organizations. On this slide, we see Drucker's quote in the red, where he begins to speak about how important the knowledge worker will already be in the 21st century. He's writing this in the mid 20th century. On the top of the slide, there's a quote of his that talks about how predominantly knowledge workers rather than manual workers will replace humans in the modern industry. Those characteristics describe the knowledge workers capabilities because a knowledge worker's expertise is retained in their brains, a company or organization cannot easily control or own the expertise of its employees. The knowledge workers walk off, log off, or walk out the door at the end of the day, so does the capacity of the organization to do its business. Because knowledge workers will be so prized in the future, they will have extreme employment mobility. And the implication for organizations as leaders is they'll have to be able to retain expertise and customers by being what Goldman calls resonant leaders. And because of the future landscape, knowledge workers will have to collaborate in person, remotely, or in some new ways yet to be invented. 
with a diverse group of other employees, with their subordinates, and with customers. Again, with the knowledge worker firmly in mind, let's proceed to the future. Again, we have the image of the evolution of man, and this represents a traditional bygone view of the American worker, the white male. The future, however, is gonna look quite different and for many reasons. We begin by exploring the future of the population. It's projected that as the labor force continues to grow, it will not keep up with the growth of the American population. This means a shrinking labor force overall. Additionally, the labor force is going to get older. These two uh, images represent that growth. Lots of reasons for this. Lower birth rates, young people staying in school longer before entering the workforce, older populations staying healthier, just to name a few. The labor force will also grow in its diversity. Current trends can help us understand what might come. Within the labor force currently, Gen Z alone has seen a 7% increase in persons that identifies LGBTQ. Gen Z and other generations have seen heightened need of mental health and wellness programs. Finally, the wild card, Generation Alpha will not enter the labor force for another four to five years, and the entire impact of that generation yet remains to be seen. If that wasn't enough change, consider these two images. On the left, the term natural increase refers to the difference between number of births and deaths in a population. The share of natural increase in projections of the resident population is declining, while the share of immigration in projections of the resident population is increasing nearly twice as fast. This means an ever-increasing diverse population over time. The slide on the right from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics depicts some of the impacts of that via racial and ethnic groups. We have white non-Hispanics in the top, the labor force is declining, and we see down for the Hispanic population a growth. And this will be affected in other races and ethnicities as well. So the result of all of this is what the future workforce will look much different than that traditional view in the top of the slide. It will look more like this as we go forward. And to talk about the importance of empathy, emotional intelligence, and diversity, equity, inclusion inside of this quite diverse workforce, I'm now going to turn you over to Amira and JD. Thank you, Gil. So as we start to understand the dynamics of future generations and the involvement of multiple generations in the workforce, we need to pay attention to what their motivation and their needs are. Let's start out with a poll. So with the growth of technology in the workforce, let's take a look at what the research determines as the most valued skill sets. What do you think? Um, what do you think are ranked most by most important by employers? Um, all right. So if you answered D, social skills, then you are correct. Before we get into the research, I want to introduce you to Dr. Santor Nishizaki. Our group had the distinct pleasure of interviewing Dr. Sandra Nishizaki, who in this clip discusses some of the lessons that we learned from COVID. To help us communicate better. Um, I mean, finally people can use Zoom. I've been using Zoom since before it was cool. Uh, so it's nice that people can use Zoom. And we couldn't have, look at this, we're having this conversation today uh, and that made, technology made this possible. But I, I think that we have to, the offline work is more important than the online work which is having those phone conversations, having time to think and innovate. And then some of that should be in person. I mean, I'm really happy. I mean, are you all taking classes in person now? Yes. yes. Yeah. So how nice was that to see your, your classmates again, um, or maybe for the first time, rather than just doing virtual, virtual sessions, right? That's where empathy can develop and, and connecting with people. So I don't feel, feel fully remote. I mean, it may be a good option for some folks, but loneliness has gone up from my research, what I saw, um, with spe specifically with Gen Z, and it's with all generations, but we saw an uptick. It was like over 50% of the Gen Zs we surveyed nationally. Uh, we hired a, a market research firm, Qualtrics, to do a, a survey for the book. Said loneliness was over 50% felt more lonely while working remote. And then anxiety and depression went up. Uh, almost 50% reported increased depression and anxiety uh, while working remote. So I, I do think that technology is really good for some days, some days, but we just need to have heads down, work in a spreadsheet, 
where it could be too distracting in the office. But we, when, when we have important conversations, leadership conversations, a lot of that should be done in person if possible. And, we, and organizations need to rethink the way they, they lead. Thank you, Dr. Nishizaki, for your insight. Um, okay, so ironically, in the years that advances in technology have increased, the research shows that the demand for soft skills also increased congruently. Um, the next slide, I want to show you some of the research that we highlight, some of the research that we did. And, and some of these were like the Deloitte 2015 study, which revealed that social skills ranked highest, including customer and personal service knowledge, active listening skills, problem sensitivity, speaking, and critical thinking. Also, Harvard Business Study and interviews with over 2,000 executives. The highest rated skills were unique to humans, problem solving, empathy, emotional intelligence, creativity, and collaboration. Pew Research also consistently ranked active listening and critical thinking skills at the top. So what we found essentially is that consistent across many sectors, as tech replaces physical work and increases the information flow, the demand for social skills in the knowledge worker also increase. So, on this very next slide, I want to translate the social skills demand to earnings. So it turns out that many large corporations are all also willing to pay more than over $100,000 a year for employees with social skills, such as empathy and emotional intelligence. You can see two of the examples of the wordings here from two of the companies. And I want you to think about why that might be, why that might be that they're paying more for this. Um, if you're pointing to the leadership collaboration, connectivity, and relationship building that is essential with these skills. Um, often the fate of complex projects depends on getting everyone pulling in the same direction. So employers and organizations don't want just the soft skills of the knowledge worker. They're also willing to pay more for it. So that is key. All right. So now we're going to take another poll. Let's transition to how important leadership and social skills are to the workforce. So um, as you look at this poll, I want you to think about why social skills are essential for, for leadership. So currently, what percentage of the United States employees are engaged at work? So what percentage of U.S. employees feel like they're engaged at work? And, and these are rated by performance indicators such as absenteeism, profitability, et cetera. Um, what might that be? So while you think about that, I don't want to share the answer till I go to the next slide, but I also want to um, ask you to think, think about this. When you think about why you're promoted, why employees are promoted to higher positions, um, what are some of the reasons why they're promoted? Think about that. If you've been promoted as well, what were some of the criteria that they used to promote you? So if you're thinking to technical and analytical skills, that is often true. Also tenure and experience. Um, so in regards to leadership and some of these soft skills, training can be really crucial to the effectiveness of a leader. Approximately 60% of leaders say they were not trained when they're promoted. So, so this is really key. So, so now I know you're, you're, you want this answer. So let's go to the next slide and see what the answer of how many employees are engaged at work. If you guess 30%, then you are correct. Um, so what this means to say is great leaders have a direct impact on employee morale, motivation, and engagement. So, so that is very key. So Another significant impact on engagement is related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so to expand on this, I'm going to give you my partner, J.D. McCoy. Thank you, Amira. Now, let's take a deeper dive into diversity, equity, and inclusion. J.D., before we continue, we're going to do another poll. Why do you think most employees quit their jobs? If you answered B, you are correct. Employees don't feel valued and they don't feel like they belong to the organization. So they end up leaving. JD, continue on. Thank you, Narani. Okay, this slide depicts the definitions of diversity, equity, and inclusion. In summary, DEI can be defined as the set of measures taken to create awareness about differences, influence in minds, influence in behaviors to embody diversity, practice fairness, and inspire inclusion. Employees want to be heard. They want to be seen and they want to be accepted at work. This is inextricably linked to emotional intelligence as it requires leaders to exercise self-awareness, meet others where they are in the moment, and to be empathetic to their needs, desires, and concerns. According to McKinsey's report, diversity as a revenue engine, I wanna emphasize this report was focused on 
diversity as a revenue engine. It found that investing in DEI leads to cost savings through reduced attrition and absenteeism and faster yet less expensive recruiting. It also contributes to the top line as well. More importantly, the report found that companies in the top quartile for gender diversity on their executive teams were 25% more likely to experience above average profitability than companies in the fourth quarter and 36% likely to perform margins for ethnic and cultural diversity. We live in a very diverse world. And the thought process now is that more than ever before, people are looking for diversity in places that they patronize and where they spend their money. Prospective employees are looking for diverse companies for work. They're looking at organizational charts. They want to see diversity at all levels of the organization so they can feel comfortable being a part of the team. Also, customers are looking to see people in the workforce that look like them, perhaps speak the same language and engaging employees they feel comfortable with. That all impacts the top and bottom lines of an organization's income statement. According to Forbes, McKinsey's research into why employees were resigning from work resulted in employers, I can only emphasize employers because this statement came from employers, employers stating that it was due to compensation, work-life balance, and poor physical and emotional health. In contrast, McKinsey's report found that 51% of employees left the workforce because they did not feel a sense of belonging. They felt like they were undervalued. The graphs in the center of the chart highlight the disparity of white women and white men versus non-white employees and how they feel about belonging in the workplace. Overall, this is a case of senior leaders not communicating with their employees, some employees feeling marginalized, and the organization not practicing DEI. Future leaders must embrace DEI. They must get to know their employee, employee, know their concerns and ambitions, listen to their ideas, and include them in planning efforts to get the best input for personal growth as well as organizational expansion opportunities. If leaders do not embrace DEI, it could result in negative consequences such as loss of revenue, net income, skills retention, higher recruiting and training costs. This slide provides several measures that leaders and senior leaders can take to improve future conditions and to develop the workforce. They can create a DEI strategy, implement it into the business, improve the culture, morale, and embrace cognitive diversity. Research has shown that making these types of improvements contribute to employees, customers, and clients' satisfaction. It also increases an organization's ability to remain relevant and sustainable well into the future. Now I will hand it over to Jose so he can talk to the technology piece. That's great. Thank you very much, JD. Uh, let's talk about technology. In 1912, Henry Ford created the assembly line, which took producing a Ford Model T from 12 hours to 93 minutes. It also took dozens of staff conducting manual labor to produce a Ford Model T. It now takes one minute to produce a Tesla with many robotics and only human involvement on the engineering or maintenance side of the robotics and, and on the quality assurance. Uh, let's go on to our first question or our, our one of our survey questions here. On the path to 2030 and beyond, which of the following forces or factors do you believe will be the most disruptive force to the future workforce? If you answered B, artificial intelligence and machine learning, then you are correct. Um, and we'll go ahead and talk about a little bit uh, about uh, a study here. Uh, in January 24th, 2017, Cambridge University Press published a paper on smart technology, artificial intelligence, 
Robotics and Algorithms, otherwise known as STERA. The report basically stated that by 2027, uh, driving a truck will be automated and will no longer require human interaction. By 2049, uh, AI will be able to write a best-selling book. And by 2053, we'd have robotics and, and machine learning uh, strong enough to work as a surgeon. Um, obviously, the impact to humanity is, is large, as one-third of jobs could be lost by 2030. Uh, we have 50% chance of a uh, Stara outperforming in all tasks uh, within 45 years and automating all human jobs in 120 years. Most employees are unaware of these projections, and when made aware, ten it tends to drop their organizational commitment, their job satisfaction declines, and turnover increases. Uh, increased experience of depression is also uh, felt by these uh, employees. One way we can help mitigate this is by ensuring that we leverage e-learning uh, to start to train our, our staff and our employees and give them the tools that they need to be successful. Um, we can also look at virtual reality to create, create immersive learning experiences where they can actually um, travel and, and to other parts of the world and get training without having to spend money on lodging or, or flights or any sort of uh, gas or, or travel costs. Um, we also have uh, artificial intelligence that can help start to predict problems and start to ensure that we start training our uh, employees in a better way and more efficient way. And we also can leverage dashboards and analytics to help ensure that we're tracking our progress properly and ensuring that we have the best tools available for our staff. Um, to wrap it up, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Gil. Thanks, Jose. At the top is our original question, which after exploring the future space and what problems that might occur, uh, our team realized that we actually needed to reframe our question. And we would now change our question to read as the increasingly diverse workforce prepared for the post-industrial era of empathy. What skills, skill sets are most needed in the future and how can leaders and organizations best prepare? And to help us answer that question, we look over to the left. What will be the trends that will continue to reshape the workplace? Well, we've talked about the greater diversity of the future workplace and the need for empathy, communication, and mental health. We talked about the preeminence of the knowledge worker in the era of empathy, and of course, of the ubiquitous technology, which can either be a disruption or a blessing for leaders if they choose to, if they choose to embrace it. And we know that the future of work is going to impact leadership and the role of leaders. Because leaders will, because of the isolating nature of future technology and work itself, have to be more effective at building community, engaging and developing subordinates and customers. They will need to be technologically enabled resident leaders. And so now we answer that larger question. As we prepare for the post industrial era of empathy, organizations, employees, and customers are going to be best served by leaders who have resident leader skills, who are bold in the face of unprecedented change, and who can embrace technology with courage. And they can best prepare by openly, openly accepting the reality that's coming, embracing it as an opportunity to do good for others, training themselves and others in EI and DEI, advocating for technologies that assist them in an era of change. And senior leaders should be advocating for education system and workplace training that prepares students and workers for the future. Senior leaders can also advocate for policies and regulations at the highest levels and across government to ensure this future is enabled with good, effective governance. And finally, each of us, leaders and employees alike, can be the change they want to see in their workplaces. And so we come to our conclusion. There might be wild cards events. The future might be unknown, but the path is lit with lots of information and indicators of what could come, we only need to embrace it. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, our team is open for any questions.